Ronda Rousey has released, or is about to release, her second book, Our Fight. And she released, or publisher released several ex- excerpts uh, from it, and including some very harsh words directed against WWE. And then she also did an interview yesterday, as we record this as well. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Further blasting a couple of people with WWE. So bear with me, everybody. Did you blast me? Did you, did you ever, blast you, me? Did you, you never worked with her, did you? No. Podcaster, Dutch Mantel. <laughs> Challenges Ronda Rousey. Yeah. yeah. In naked mud rush. That's what the last video should be. I'll just title it completely wrong, like totally oh, yeah. clickable, and then it's like, oh, well, you know, you clicked on it, you fell for it. Right, so here's some of the quotes, and I will be doing a bit of speaking. Do bear with me. It's hard sometimes to know where the evil, unethical slimeball character of Vince McMahon played out for the camera ends, and the actual questionably ethical, many times sued and multiple times accused of sexual misconduct Vince McMahon begins. That blurred line between character and reality is a recurring theme within the WWE universe. Another excerpt reads... Pay-per-views are held in major cities in New York, Los Angeles and Philadelphia, as well as now twice a year in Saudi Arabia, a nation that restricts the rights of women in a way that I'm certain Vince McMahon wishes he could. Elsewhere in the book, Rousey talks about how female talent in WWE has been treated in the company, and this is really the meat of it, I guess. So WWE loves to do well-produced video segments about the legacy of women within the organisation, but the truth is women have largely been footnotes. For the longest time, they were relegated to serving male characters in a valet role, an overly sexualized supporting character that takes cheap shots when the ref isn't looking. Over time, as the level of female talent grew in the society, as a whole started to shift, the organisation gradually expanded the role of female wrestlers. I'm not quite sure whether... I mean, she's sort of blaming society there rather than WWE, I guess. But anyway, WWE builds itself as a sports entertainment organization. And just like in the mainstream entertainment industry, there was, by all accounts, a casting couch culture where men backstage in powerful positions pressured female talent for sexual favors in return for airtime. There were so what? many public... I, would you believe? Would <sighs> you believe? Now, there were so many public accusations it? and scandals, it's hard to keep track, and more than that, I'm sure the WWE managed to sweep it under the rug. She continues to say the company only began giving female talent more airtime after they were basically armbarred into it. And it was only after WWE was basically armbarred into it, following a global social media backlash, after divas were given a total of 30 seconds less time than it takes most people to read this paragraph for a nationally televised tag match, four women were given less time to collectively wrestle than every single man on the roster got for his intro music alone. One more quote. Presented this information as a person outside of wrestling uh, world, you might draw the conclusion that there is a troubling foundational sexist patriarchal culture within WWE. You would be right. I have nothing but respect for the female wrestlers who paved the way for women wrestlers today, and nothing but disgust for the amount of sexist, degrading bullshit they were put through. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, I've got a couple more quotes, but I mean, Ronda's not wrong. I mean, women's wrestling has only been taken seriously in the last few years in this in the states, anyway. Other than me, yes, in you, TNA, yes, you yes, took it I, seriously. Well, that's a very good uh, point. You, you were one of the first to actually say. These no, I showed I showed Vince, and I'm not saying it's because it's me, but I always thought that if you treated these the girls seriously as a serious uh, a serious competition and an athletic competition, that yes, they could they could they could draw ratings and draw money. And I proved that with Gail Kim and Kong. And we did almost the highest rating up to that point in TNA ever. And I think the only other segment that beat it was when Hulk Hogan was there the first time. Mm-hmm. And we did almost a 3.5. That's pretty good. Great. And Gail Kim and Kong went out there and really, really, as they say now, had a banger. They did. So, but... Uh, I don't know how to take Rhonda's quote. She was mad about some other things too when she said this. And I don't I don't question or doubt what she said is is true. But you also can't doubt that what they paid her was a a pretty decent sum of money. Do you know what they suggested? I heard recently. I was th- heard that Rhonda made like a million plus, but I heard recently that Ronda, when she first came into WWE, was making either second or third biggest amounts in WWE behind Brock Lesnar and maybe Roman Reigns. 
So we're well, talking about that. the eight million mark. Eh, I don't know about it there, but you know, people are going to believe what they're going to believe. I don't think eight million, but I think she was paid better than most of those other girls combined mm -hmm. because of her uh, MMA <clears throat> background. And well, she was a, but she's to the me, only pay per view draw. She was a proven pay per view draw in UFC, maybe third biggest of all time, still. Maybe. And okay, so I'll tell you what kind of draw she is. I'm not an MMA fan, but she was beating the crap out of those other girls. She got my attention. So I'm using myself as a, uh, a, a barometer on what she can do. And when she knocked out those first two girls, I mean, first round, like two minutes in, she'd tap them out with that. She'd take them off their feet first, and she was very, very good at that. Where she wasn't good was throwing the hands. And that's what that Holly Holmes showed her. And she was rocking her, rocking her. And she she didn't get beat with on, on the mat. She got beat standing up and yep. then got stretched out on the mat. She was knocked out. Yep. High, high yeah. kick to the head, it was. Oh, whatever she knocked her out with. But... And then from that, then on out, you heard no more from Ronda Rousey. And I like the part that she, Rowdy Ronda, she got that from, uh, from Rowdy Roddy Piper. She was a big fan of his. And she was a fan of wrestling to start off with. But when she got in and who, who's the guy that runs a uh, MMA? What's it? Dana White. Yeah. When he saw her, he said, wow, we got something with her. And those two matches that she just totally dominated and beat those girls in the first round, well, you know he had dollar dollar marks going through his head. And then I forgot who they put her against, Holly Holm or somebody else. It was Holly Holm, remember. and then um, I'll find out in a second. I've Drawn a blank on Holly the, Holly on Holm the was the last one, right? No, there was one more after that. Okay. Amanda Nunes. I didn't even I just remembered it. She came and, back for a return with yeah. Amanda Nunes, and but the fact is that she had a, a trainer who for whatever reason insisted that Ronda Rousey go toe to toe with Amanda Nunes. And it's like Ronda can't box. Not not compared right. to Amanda. No. Or or Holly Holm. Her strength with ju was judo, submissions, well, ground game, all, and she left if, it. I mean I, I can't even train a dog, so don't even ask me about how do you train an MMA fighter. But I'm saying, Rhonda, this is what I would have said. I think most fans would have said her her strong point is on the mat. Take them off their feet so they can't knock you out with the punches. Hell, I saw that. But she tried to go toe to toe with them and got knocked out. So, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, just in Whatever. UFC, it, just in UFC, she did get three, no, uh, well, two knockouts and one TKO, and then she, uh, yeah, lost to KO and TKO to Amanda Nunes and Holly Holmes. Uh, before and, I forget, and, uh, and that push was over. Yeah, it was done. Well, they got one return match with Amanda Nunes, but then by that point, she was sort of exposed. I, I mean, it's like Conor McGregor though; she was as big a star as, nearly as big a star as Conor McGregor at the time. And well, I she was. Conor keeps on losing. And yet he can, he's weirdly like Nate Diaz, keeps on losing, but yet somehow people keep still buying pay per views. Yeah, he's still a draw. Still a draw. Ronda, I think, could have been the same thing, at least for a couple more bouts. But uh, I want to get to something else that Ronda was saying in the quotes here, or the excerpts, excuse me. Is that even when you were in the WWE in the mid 2010s, I gather that women wrestlers were basically told not to wrestle like the men, they were told to. You know, they were hampered to a point in their matches because they were told to essentially not do as many spots as the men and uh, they had to sort of like sneak stuff in and then gradually they'd be able to wrestle like the men like they wanted to. I don't know what they told them, but they weren't booked on their ability to wrestle professionally. They were booked on their ability of how they looked. They were like strippers. They were like eyepieces, but because Vince didn't believe in it, he just didn't. Now, since the new regime is there, 
And since I had already proven in like 2008, when I had Kong and Gal Kim in TNA, they knew it could, they, they could draw. They just had to find, they just had to find a formula. And they, they found it, but they didn't want to use it. I guess. I don't know. Because I can hear Vince now tell them to stop that damn wrestling. You know, it's, believe me, I, I think Vince, unless he, if he was doing the booking by himself, WWE would have never reached the heights that it reached. Vince was good, organization, uh, presentation, but as far as the in-ring work, no, we had to have actual wrestlers come in like Pat Patterson. I'd say that he had a, he understood the product, I think, more than anybody. Or even Road Dog. Road Dog understood it because if you ever see a Road Dog match, it's all, it's all gimmicked up and everything else. He's having a good time. And when a good heel knocks him down, and starts beating the crap out of him, people want to see him get up. You know, he, he, I think Road Dog always connected with the fans and he was a good agent to tell these guys, don't do that there. Wait a minute. Let's bring it over here if we even keep it in. Uh, and that's another job that is not highly appreciated in WWE is the agents. That's why sometimes in AEW, you don't, you don't get the best match possible because I, I've heard, I'm not there, so I don't know. I hear they just overlook the agent. The agent is just the message boy coming, telling them who's going over and how long they got. But for actual, the construction of the match and putting it together, they don't even listen to him. But in WWE, they listen because they're told to listen. And how can you get a guy like, let's say, uh, Brock Lesnar had no, no pro wrestling experience. He had to learn all this stuff. And who was the other guy that had the long winning streak? What's his name? The tanker. No, Goldberg. No, Goldberg. Goldberg still can't wrestle. If you told him to go 10 minutes, you say, God, when's this going to be over? They conditioned fans to say, hey, it's going to be a two-minute deal. Both He's going to hit him. Goldberg yeah, if it goes that long, and then it's over. That was his whole, that was his whole deal. But uh, getting back to the girls, I don't think Vince wanted it because <laughs> I don't think he understood it. And he didn't think they would, uh, they would really draw money. Yeah. Vince, Vince McMahon's relationship with women is um, something we've often discussed on this podcast recently, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that for there. Okay, you know how uh, Laurinaitis, how he found these girls, right? Yeah, just picked them out of a catalog, some of them, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he'd call them up. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned John Laurinaitis. Right, so in a subsequent interview about... Uh, this uh, 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 promoting the book Rhonda said the following uh, and followed up with comments uh, pre, uh, with the book uh, describing WWE and how much of an absolute shit show it is at the WWE they can't hold, hold a sword over my head and hold me hostage with my own career I don't need anything from them and I don't intend on going back I can say everything I think and feel where everyone else that is held captive by their organisation cannot Rousey said she was held back on saying even more about her WWE experiences than she did in the book due to a contractual word count. She specifically took aim at John Laurinaitis and Bruce Pritchard, who she was going to talk so much shit about, saying in an earlier part of the interview that the two could go, and I'll leave it there, F themselves. The former WWE Raw and SmackDown Women's Champion also revealed that her career ended due to concussions that she first started suffering during her judo career. She said that she had to keep them a secret for years so she could continue to compete and perform, adding that WWE has a complicated history with their talents getting concussed, so she felt she couldn't talk about it. So, John Laurinaitis, Bruce Pritchard, doesn't like WWE, and then the complicated 
uh, relationship and history with concussions, especially in the last few years. So what's the question? Well, okay, let's go on Laura Nitus and Bruce Pritchard. Do you think, I don't know what happened <laughs> with, with, with Ronda Rousey and those two, but I mean, John Laura Nitus is well, one of the most they, derided, they, certainly. Bruce Pritchard, some are, some aren't. Well, I don't think they tried anything with Ronda at all because she could have whipped both them at the same time, probably. Uh, and Ronda now, is, she's mad at WWE, right? Yes. She's pissed at them. Very. That's why she'd come out with this book. And a lot of people will read it because she's negative about WWE. I get that. But yet at the same time, there is no... I don't guess acknowledgement that WWE helped her through a rough time. Her UFC or MMA career was blown up. She couldn't get a match somewhere in Tupelo, Mississippi. Nobody would, they, they wanted to see her. But Vince did, or somebody did, and they gave her a job, a well-paying job, for her to not go out there and suffer any more concussions and be a name out there. And when they first signed her, I was, I had my doubts. I said, I, I don't get it. And really, did she ever draw any big houses? She was a part of a card. Yes. Or she, no. She, uh, what was her biggest thing in, what was her biggest thing in WWE? I think the biggest thing in WWE was she headlined the only women's card WWE have ever done on pay-per-view. Okay. And I think it did quite well. Okay. Oh, it would do good. I'm not saying it won't, but I'm saying her by herself. Ah, ah, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you something else. And with Ronda Rousey, her value her greatest value to WWE was to Fox at the time because on the strength of uh, Ronda being hired and, and Fox wanted Ronda on SmackDown, mm -hmm. that's how WWE partially got such a great deal to move SmackDown to Fox in 2019 for, what was it, 2 billion or 2.1 billion or whatever it is over the course of five years. Little did Fox know that Ronda Rousey's one-year contract was about to come up and then she'd leave. But uh, weirdly, Ronda Rousey's greatest that, value yeah, to that, WWE was that. That may have been a huge sticking point in those negotiations, not knowing when Ronda's contract is going to be up. Okay, so her contract was up and then she left? Yeah, pretty much like, I don't know, like a, a couple of months afterwards or something. Now, okay, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. Why wouldn't WWE try to keep her? She, she wanted kids. She wanted kids. So she uh, went to raise a family for a few years, and then came back for a year, and then the. And what was she making? What what was she making? You think? Five million plus a year, I think. See, I don't, I don't get that. Put yourself in the role of, of, of a female. But you do, I hear every weekend. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't. No, no, I, I, I took it in on a Saturday and get people to call me Mildred. Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> but five million dollars. If I was a female and I wanted to have kids, well, that would just have to take a little bit of a back seat <laughs> for a couple of years. <clears throat> so I, I got the money to raise this child. Yeah, but if you got thirty million in the bank anyway, I think at that point you just don't care. She was, she was rich enough for MMA anyway. Uh, do you know? What, okay, right? I, I got that. Yeah. I think, uh, oh, very briefly, uh, the complicated history. I'm not even really sure we can sort of say the complicated history with um, concussions and not telling people in WWE because they take you off the road and stuff like that. And I know some wrestlers who have uh, tragically told the truth on their physicals before they went to WWE and then they wouldn't hire them to wrestle, that kind of thing. So I think it's almost second nature, even though concussion protocol is much improved and you know they're far more sympathetic to injuries if you have the wrong type of injury it could cost you your career before it even starts with them so who can blame wrestlers and personnel like that from being secretive about their medical histories in that sense i was always straight up truthful dutch is what they call me i've got i would tell the truth everybody <laughs> i would tell the truth even if it hurt me i would just tell them the truth so 
You know, I even had to take a physical, a full physical for the Uncle Zebaka, well, not Uncle Zebaka, for the uh, Zeb Coulter position. And that, listen, and they flew me to, I think, either Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. I don't remember which one. I got, I'm confused. But I had to take a whole physical and do all the whole deal. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm a manager. What are they, what are they concerned about? But, but I passed it, so I got a job. That's all I was worried about. 